morning rounds. A couple of reminders before we start the session. This session is currently being recorded and will be posted later on our website. There will be a Q&A session at the end, so please add your questions in the Q&A feature below and not in the chat box so that it's easier to moderate. And now I'll let Dr. Mustelin introduce our speaker for today. Thank you, Danielle. So it is a really great uh, pleasure and honor uh, to introduce our Grand Rounds uh, speaker this morning, uh, Dr. Lars Klareskog uh, from, uh, the, uh, from Sweden, from the uh, Karolinska Institute. Um, so Dr. Klareskog um, earned his MD degree from the Uppsala University in 1974 and a PhD degree um, at the same university in 1978. Uh, studying uh, MHC class two transplantation antigens. I actually looked up some of those papers and it's truly fascinating to, uh, to read um, how uh, back then uh, science was done. And I just like to remind all the early career scientists that there, there was a time when you could not go to the internet and look up the human genome and figure out genes. You actually had to do uh, a very hard work to figure out um, what proteins looked like and what they were composed of and generate antibodies and, and figure out uh, their structure and, and function. So remarkable uh, work. Um, after his uh, PhD, uh, Dr. Klareskog uh, worked as a research fellow uh, in, in rheumatology. Uh, he did some clinical work for uh, almost a decade and then became um, both professor and chairman of clinical immunology at Uppsala University, and a little later on, a professor and chairman of, of the rheumatology clinic and uh, rheumatology research unit at the Karolinska Institute. And he is uh, a professor of rheumatology at the Department of Medicine at uh, the Karolinska uh, ever since. Um, he has uh, led many um, organizations uh, in Sweden, he has served on the uh, Nobel Assembly, um, also on the Nobel uh, Committee. So any of you out there with uh, aspirations to the Nobel Prize, you may want to have a little chat with uh, Dr. Clarice Hogan, what to do to get there. Um, he has uh, led a research group and multiple large uh, consortia uh, in rheumatology, uh, research-wise, and more broadly. Uh, he has worked in most rheumatological conditions. I think all of us are familiar with many of his papers and cite them in our uh, publications, maybe most of all in the area of rheumatoid arthritis. Um, I'd like to, like to mention that uh, Dr. Klarskog has a, a very thick paragraph of uh, prizes and accomplishments he has uh, supervised 62 PhD students, and he doesn't um, know exactly how many publications he has anymore. He gives the number as approximately 700. Uh, I looked it up on, on PubMed and I find, found 708 of them, uh, starting from uh, these MHC discoveries all the way to uh, uh, lots of papers on multiple uh, rheumatological conditions. So today, uh, Dr. Clarence Cook is going to uh, give us a um, lecture with a title Towards Prevention of Rheumatoid Arthritis, Hurdles and Challenges. So Lars, please go ahead. The microphone is yours. So thank you a lot, Thomas, for this very kind introduction. And it's a great honor to be here again. I've been here several times in Seattle and really like it. And I should say that also Christian Lud is one of the people who invited me and I say that I tried to recruit him to Karinska, but you were more successful in Seattle. So I know that he has a very happy time here. So uh, this uh, uh, lecture, I wanted to talk about what you could do towards prevention because uh, this is my disclosures. And then just to say the context so that within Europe, we have the advantage of having EU grants for different type of consortia. And one of them, which, I'll, I'll leave just in the end, is called quite, quite brave, Roma tolerance for cure. And basically what we try to do is try to understand the very earliest phase of RA, including the pre-RA state, and then go 
as close as we can to very specific uh, uh, therapies, ultimately tolerance therapies, which we are not yet there, as you know. And then the other one is that we have a other project, which is called DigiPrevent, where we use digital tools to make it possible to identify those individuals who are at risk for getting RA and make trials and ultimately intervene there. And I will come to that in the end. So the point of the lecture is just in the front page. I usually do that in order to say what I will want to tell you. And that is, uh, you have this curve of emerging RA and we've tried to find how could we intervene in various places in a smart way in that um, process. This is sort of popular side just to in indicate why both it's possible and why it's needed, because this indicates that uh, the curve is to the right is a number of days of sick leave per month. And in the middle, you see the R diagnosis. And the point of this slide is that both that sick leave begins often up to a year before you have the onset of RA, despite we are very quick in identifying these individuals, we know that that is far before we have the first signs of arthritis. And that is much dependent on pain and fatigue. And then it also illustrates that we do not um, cure the patients afterwards. We patients in this case with sick leave continue to be off and have significant problems. The next slide is just to indicate that this RA, as everything else in life, is unequal. So in this case, just shows that this uh, effect on sick leave, that indicate that the RA strikes, strikes different individuals very differently. So you see that those with a high education, they go back to work and live normal uh, afterwards, whereas those uh, with low education, they still stay up out of work and probably with significant problems. This is another slide which I will come to back to in the end. Uh, and this is from the Dutch study showing that the importance, as you're surely aware, that the earlier you treat, and this is the long-term effect, if you begin treating 12 weeks after, more than 12 weeks after the first diagnosis or not, and you see that the curves before and after differ a lot also over many years afterwards. And this shows that we have a need to identify very fast. And I will come to that, back to that. So anyway, this is the slide many of us show all the time of sort of a ladder from having a, a uh, activation of immune response, mainly about citronate antigens, but also rheumatoid factors. And then you have, uh, different steps towards the development of RA. Not all do, but we put often that as a linear type of thing. And I will show in this lecture that we should challenge this concept. So needs for prevention, of course, we have to have better understanding of physiology. And of course, a reduction of disease inducing modifiable factors and increase the presence of protective ones. And of course, have a better understanding of molecular pathogenesis which is obvious part of our research. So the beginning was, of course, we, we tried to always to say, what is the interaction between nature and nurture? And um, one of the things that we have tried to work on for many years is to also put an, an emphasis on the nurture, not only in genetics. And this gives us to the tools that we have used for many years trying to understand that. And this is the rheumatology networks uh, that we have in uh, registers that we have in uh, Sweden. And um, this is um, a system where we, from mid 90s, when we set up this, beginning at Karolinska, we made registers for basically all patients with RA and now increasing all other diseases you will hear from myositis in the afternoon. And then based on that, we could also set up a case control study where we take all patients who are newly, uh, newly diagnosed uh, in certain areas of Sweden, including Clarolinska, and then pick healthy controls from the population, exactly the same sex, the same day, born, the same area. And then we ask them all detailed questions of what do they experience before they got the disease. And we also make lots of genetics and immunology and biomarkers. And by those means, we could then also 
try to understand nature and nurture. And this is a very old slide, but it was a starting point for us being interested in the antibodies against citronated antigens, which of course were present a few years before, but we didn't really put them into context. And this shows that in the aquapositive RNA, as you see, if you have the MEC genes, which we call shed epitope, as you know, if you have two copies of that and you are not a smoker, you have an increased risk of theta four. Whereas if you are a smoker, it goes up to 20. And if you have a smoker, it goes up to 40. And this was specific for aquapositive RNA, both the genetics and the environment. And that sort of told us that, and we also at the same time saw that citronation actually happens in the lungs uh, upon, uh, upon smoking. And that was the basis for formulation, what we nowadays call the mucosal hypothesis, that immunity related to RNA may begin in the lungs. However, as you all know, smoking is happily now the, the, on the on the strongly um, historic thing. We hope, and then the question is: Is this still relevant? And this is a study which was published uh, just um, uh, a few months ago in Annals uh, from this, uh, my postdoc and colleague Cha Jiang, and Power and her student Bao and Tang. And what we did was that uh, we looked at occupation exposures meaning that we ask for what occupations did these individuals have. And then we used what is called a job exposure matrix. And seeing that this ex a job exposure matrix could, ex could indicate what were the exposures for airborne um, noxious substances uh, over many years. And we put that together and see how much exposure for various things did various individuals in the population with RA and without RA have over the, over the time. And this is a complex slide just showing that we have very many exposures from detergents, from diesel oil, from diesel exhaust, from silica, more and more. And lots of things have an impact on risk for RA, but on, on, almost only in aqua positive disease, very little in aqua negative disease. This is just examples. If you then take, in this case, we also did that not only shared epitope on MHC, but also a genetic risk score, sort of combining uh, more or less all the known SNPs uh, predisposing for RA or for aqua positive RA. And as you can see here, if we then add the genetics, the particular environment exposures, asbestos or, or gasoline engine exhaust or quest just, and then add genetics and smoke and this thing. Then you get to risk figures, which you can see on the right axis is between 20 and 40. And I often <laughs> compare that with what you find in when you do genetics only, you're very happy if you find a risk SNP with a, an odds ratio of 1.2. Uh, so this really matters. My point of, show, of showing this picture is that this exposure to the airways and this pathway of developing disease is not unique for smoking by any means. It's still there for a number of exposures that we see in our environment, and which of course should drive us to see if we want to have prevention on the public health measure level, we should really try to reduce these types of exposures. The other thing is, of course, we have lots of Thinking now about bacteria, the most well known is Perforamonas gingivalis, present in periodontitis, but also a bit elsewhere. And there was other bacteria which could also be citronated, and you could then have immune activity against them. And this is just a, one of the infectious agents. It happens to be a coronavirus, it's not, um, it's not COVID, but it shows that in first study from Korea that the more exposures to this um, coronavirus you have, and you have exposures in the x-axis, and you have incidents, the uh, numbers of incident cases of RNA in population on the y-axis, showing that the more of these exposures you have, then the more RNA you get. But this is a bit of a fun picture, I think, uh, because patients also, ask me and I think you, 
well, we have heard that if you have cold, you get a chitis from cold. And if you have some load on your joints, you get a chitis from that. And often said, I often said, we didn't know. And then this very talented Chinese Indian, Indonesian student, Ping Ling, came and she set up this slide and saying that this was not an old uh, a new thought, neither in China nor in Greece. So uh, better to study it in ERA. And what we found was that working in cold indeed had a effect and gave an increased risk for our working mainly in the cool disk of supermarkets and such things, but also outside. And physical workload as well. And this just shows the various types of exposures of physical load and various type of repetitive movements also had a risk. I don't, and this, the more of these exposures you have, the more risk you, ha you have for RA and it comes up to quite substantial numbers. So that means that I could tell that if you have a particular genetic exposure, a genetic um, basis of that, maybe these things can contribute. So we could tell our patients, maybe you should change your work style or things if you have an emerging RA. So anyway, back to the lungs, which has been a major focus of ours, and in particular from my, unfortunately, uh, uh, my colleague Anka Katrina, was my successor who died from cancer the other year. She studied the lung and we have continued. And seeing what happens in the lung upon smoking and silic exposure, whatever. And we know that both we have an activation of, of course, active and anti amputating cells by the activation of toll-like receptors. But we also have a lot of changes, post translation modifications, amongst them citrullination. And that happens in the lung. Also in the lung, we have lots of microbes and we have studied also the microbiome of the lung. Not found so much yet, but I think that lots of things remains to be found that we could also have cross reactivity between citrinated bacteria and self, similar to what has been shown now in MS for DVD, for example. So that's a field of active studies, of course, but it can also be that you have it in endogenous with a situation of really autoantigens. Then I have to see that there are also protective factors. And it appears in this state a bit surprising to us, a number of other infections from the gut and uh, from um, genital infections were protective. I think that that indicates that there's something with the microbe microbiome there, but we really don't know. But just indicate that there are protective factors. This is a bit more spectacular. We and others have found that use of alcohol actually is very protective for risk of getting RA. This is an old study, but then it has been confirmed in a number of um, core studies, not all, but I think that this is quite consistent now. And as you see, the reduction of risk for RA when you drink some alcohol, it's largest in smokers. So for others, you have a reduction, a reduction of about 50%, but in smokers, you may have a reduction of 75%. And I think that we may learn a lot of interesting things from that because you have to have the metabolites of alcohol, acetate, then fumarate, and others, which may affect the uh, adaptive immune system in a very distinct way. And we also now know from a very nice study from Erlangen a few years ago that alcohol actually affects the T cell response in a quite specific manner, reducing T follicular help with cell master transcription factor, be said at 16, and also affecting PD-1 and IL-21. So alcohol has effects, and we could learn from them, in particular for metabolomics. Anyway, so that's about potential lessons for protection. I will come back to that. So we went back and looked into the lungs. And my, my postdoc, Vijay Joshua, he then, together with our pulmonologist, we make bronchoscopies and look what happens in the bronchial lavage fluid, both for B cells, which are rare, and for T cells, which are a little bit more prevalent. And uh, for the B cells, we then used the technique that 
eh, vill jag inte ringa det fram, vi känner något om Svensvags lär, vän Erik Meffre. Eh, just cloning these um, antibodies, sequencing Sanger B cells and plasma cells, either those identified by tetramines or identified by other means. And then putting these IDs into new cells, hex cells, and producing monoclonal antibodies. And we have done that both for individuals who do not yet have RA, uh, we can risk RA, and those who have uh, uh, RA. And we find many more B cells in a positive cells compared to our negatives. And what we found was in this study, five different antibodies, which actually react with the citronated antigens. And they have a little bit of different reactivities. Uh, so it really shows that both before and at RA, you can have the antibody producing cells against citronated antigens occurring in the lungs. And obviously, as this happens before you have any type of uh, reaction or inflammation in joints, this happens before you have uh, the uh, reaction in the joints. So initiation of immunity against these antigens happens elsewhere than in joints, in, in the lungs. So then we have pro proceeded and looked at a number of different locales uh, sites and see to see whether there are some differences between B cell phenotypes and specificities from gums, from lungs, from blood, from bone marrow, and from joints, of course. And we have made a number of different monoclonal antibodies. And the striking things a few years ago was that we made a very broad uh, peptide array. In this case, for citrulline to the left, lots of peptides out of a 50,000 library. And several thousand of these citrullinated peptides reacted with, uh, antibodies reacted with them. And different monoclonals had very different reactivity. So, in this case, these three all reacted with a number of titrinated molecules, whereas only this one and this one reacted with homocitronin or carbamylated antigens. This did not. So they are very different. And what my collaborator, uh, Caroline Grenval, has done is indicating that we have very different motifs which may differ. So we have the uh, glycine, and we have the glycine there, and we have different motifs, one or two amino acids on each side of the citrulline, and very different uh, specificities. And that is indicated in this heat map where we have antibodies, a lot of different antibodies that we have made. And the striking thing is that the fine specificities are so different and also are the different reactivity against different proteins. And some of them react also with, with carbamylated antigens, some react with with uh, acetylated antigens and some with all of them. Uh, but none of them react only with, with, uh, with carbamylated or acetylated. So the point of this slide in this context is that all these antibodies are extremely different concerning their fine specificity, despite the fact that they react so well, good with uh, CCP. So the question is, of course, then, are these antibodies pathogenic, if so, in which context. And then we, of course, know that most acupositive individuals actually don't get arthritis. And it takes some years before they do, if they have. And in contrast to some other diseases, babies to mothers with acupa, they don't get arthritis. So the question is then, are additional events needed? Or are differently? Or are there other explanations? So we have done over the years a lot of experiments trying to understand what are the roles of these antibodies in, in the different symptoms that you have. And this is, of course, you have seen that for many slides. This is our picture on if you begin with the biobank that Dante Pay in northern Sweden had, then we could see that antibodies against citrinated peptides or proteins may occur up to 20 years before onset of the disease. And then very often you have an epitope spread have more antibodies against different, different peptides and also higher titers. To close, you come to the seeds. Also, as we are very interested, of course, in knowing which of the individuals who have these antibodies 
will actually develop disease, particularly in the context of prevention. And so we want to have better prediction methods. And this, this, in this case, our Dutch colleagues in Leiden, they found originally that you also have a mutation, a somatic mutation, which happens during the evolution of this immune response that enables glycosylation of a sites of the fab fragments. And if you have those glycosylation of the fabs, then this is the red curve then you have a higher risk of getting the disease or a, as compared if you don't. So somehow this somatic mutation, and which is driven by T cells, has an importance for pathogenicity. So then we also had a number of thoughts concerning these symptoms that you saw in the beginning, that individuals at risk for RA, they often have pain and fatigue. So then when I met with Camilla Svensson, an experimental a pain scientist now at the, in, in Stockholm, and we said that these antibodies occur before, antibody, before the disease and these individuals have pain. Could we investigate whether the antibodies actually cause pain? So we purified the uh, antibodies from serum, our patients, and the IgG and CCP columns. And then the first experiment published a few years ago and we have repeated that now, shows that this shows the mechanical hypersensitivity. And the squares show that if you give the mice CCP antibodies, CCP reactive antibodies, then they get a decreased um, threshold for pain. And to the right, you also see that they moved very differently. This is another way of showing that something happens. So the IgD, if the, the CCP elevates gave you the pain, whereas the flow through, which is maybe the other 99% of the antibodies in this case, did not give pain at all. So it's very specific for citronated anti reactive antibodies. Continuing in this case, we have also used the monoclonals and seen that in this case, interesting enough, some monoclonals cause pain, others didn't. In this case, we have combined two of them, which cause CO3 and BO9, and EO2 is the control. And seeing that indeed, we have an effect on them, which becomes more chronic. If we combine the two antibodies, the effect is more transient if we just have one of them. And we have to show that if you do that in a mouse that it does not have the enzymes that are responsible for citronation, the pads, if you have a pad knockout, don't get that pain. So it's really citrine independent. And the lower part shows that this is micro CT on bones, that these antibodies also cause bone erosion and bone loss, and not so much bone erosion as seen in RA, but more bone loss. Uh, and then also that was PADI4 dependent. So it shows that the some of the major symptoms that you see before onset RA really can be caused of these antibodies. And the, we have also shown that these antibodies may bind to the osteoclasts and stimulate them to produce IL-8 and other substances. And this just shows that one of the, of the, some of the antibodies do it that way. But we also found that that is not a major way, even if it is an important way. So, some additional antibodies, they bound to instead to satellite glia cells in the dorsal root ganglia. And there, the binding of these antibodies to these dorsal root ganglia cells produce pain inducing molecules. So it means that even here, two different antibodies with different fine specificities can cause pain in two different ways. And the way that goes via, via the osteoclast, we could ameliorate by using biphosphonates and give them, uh, in this case, we see that if you have the pain threshold again, if these mice are given zolendronate, then you get away with the pain and also rep reparexin, which is the IL-8 receptor antagonist. So, and whereas the there was no effect at all on enzymes in this model, showing that 
we could, by understanding these things, we could approach going to a target to therapies for this pain, which is quite handicapping for many patients, of course. So then we know that some monoclonal antibodies and polyclonal cause symptoms in mice, similar to those preceding RA, but they do not induce arthritis. Neither are known nor in different combinations. We tried many. So our hypothesis was then, well, this is so that we need a second hit of some case for disease induction, or is it some other explanation? So in this case, Bruno Raposo, uh, a great scientist now from Portugal working in our lab, he uh, has done all these experiments, which I will show now with antibodies that were produced by others. And then we see that if you then use anticholidin antibodies, in a model called Kaya, anticholidin antibody induced arthritis, Kaya, then as we then show in many other studies, you get arthritis. However, I worked a lot with collagen immunity in my previous life and thought that that would really be the key for RA, but obviously there is not so much immunity against collagen in RA patients. It's an experimental setting. But if Bruno did the same thing with ACBA, he didn't get arthritis. That is reproducing what many others found. But then we think that, well, let's try to make a sec second hit. And then he take, took the uh, Kaya, the antibody, antibody, antibody antibodies. You always have to add a little bit of LPS to mice in order to get the uh, arthritis. But then he added also the various ACPAs, both polyclonals and monoclonals to that setting with the expectation that maybe we could get a little bit more of arthritis. Well, the first experiment he saw was that the uh, one of our favorite monoclonals called CO3, the one that caused pain via the osteoclast, was completely inhibitory for these disease development by the Kaya. Whereas one of the others, which also caused pain, called BO9, was partly inhibitory, whereas the controlled antibody we called um, uh, EO2 in this setting did not cause any effect at all, which was, of course, a bit surprising for us. Uh, as a scientist, you should always be happy when you find unexpected things. So we were happy as being surprised. Uh, and then we continued. And then this is an example of another antibody called BUCA, which the blue in the bottom shows completely inhibitory for these Kaya induced arthritis. Whereas uh, another one, which called CO4 here, if anyone, anything had a little bit, uh, that was not inhibitory at all. We continued with other antibodies. And now the yellow in this case, we call CO5 actually enhanced the arthritis as we thought that they will do, but this actually did, uh, both concerning, in this case, induction and chronicity. So we have a long lasting uh, disease if we added this CO5 to the Kaya. Continuing, uh, we also had another antibodies in this case uh, called CO4, which had a marginal effect on that. And then we went back to another previous study, which we did together with Dan Miller and his colleagues a few years ago um, by Philip Tombe. And in this case, we had used, we happened to have used these CO4 antibodies, but not the others. And uh, then used a little bit of LPS instead. And as you can see for the joint of this mouse, we had a bit of a chronic disease when we had the CO4 plus the LPS. And this to the right just shows that you also have pain the same way. And then, of course, we asked, is this the case only for the MAP center before the MURAN antibodies? I should also say that uh, all these monoclonal antibodies, when they were used in the mice, we always murinized them, despite the fact we produced them as human antibodies from human B cells and plasma cells. Then when we use them in mice, in order to have a more physiological system, we change the human FT parts to the mouse FT parts, murinized. Uh, 
Now we then use the serum from CCP elevates in this setting instead. And what you can see for the uh, blue line here is that for the uh, CCP pool, we call it pool, uh, CCP elevates from several individuals with RA. Part inhibitory, where is the flow through fraction not containing any citrine antibodies, aquas, but others, all the other things was not inhibitor at all. Okay. And finally, we asked also where, what, what was the dominating thing. So if we then had, in this case, to the left, the CCP elevate with the, and that was another CCP elevate now with the triangles, which had a very minute inhibitory effect. But if we combine that with the COC, with the antibody, which was very markedly anti-inflammatory, then we had a complete inhibition. So it means that it was these, anti these inhibitory antibodies which were dominant in that case. We are just now looking a lot of in different individuals and having CCP elevates from them and beginning to see that different individuals are very different in this context. Uh, of how much they are inhibitory and whether they are not inhibitory at all. So there's a large variability there as well. So this is another cartoon made by Caroline Grönvall, who is really the mastering of these antibody studies in the B cell lab, B cell studies in our lab, together with Bruno. And we tried to make a heritage map and see that those antibodies which are to the left here, they are the ones which are mainly inhibitory. And those who are to the right, they are mainly to some extent enhancing of disease. But we cannot yet find a very distinct pattern, unfortunately. We are, of course, looking very closely now in lots of functional assays to see which are the protective, which are the, uh, the enhancing antibodies. And the point being that we have this extremely diverse functionality, in this case, in vivo but those in a number of in vitro studies, which I have not had time to go through. So uh, just to say, show if Jane Buckner and others are possibly on the call, uh, we have also worked a lot with T-cells, a lot with her. This is Vivian Armstrong's work mainly, just saying that, of course, we're interested in T-cells in order to, not least if you want to make tolerizing therapies in the end. So then we have taken T-cells, and Vivi has done from a number of different sites. And the most interesting thing I would say is this one where we have had a protein called tenation, which was identified by Vivi and Jane together. And in the fluorospot method, the T cell activity against this particular citrinated peptides, they were much more prevalent than other reactivity against other citrinated peptides. So we have focused to some extent on this, but also working with others. And um, this just shows the fluorospot spot plates. And then the immune response towards these uh, tenacious T and more prevalent than others. Actually, on the same, almost at the same level as T cell response towards um, uh, influenza peptides, which we find remarkable given the fact that all reactive T cells are generally very very, very rare. And the point of this is now we are then cloning these receptors, of course, re-expressing them, putting them into new cells. And the point of doing this is, of course, we want to see how could we, in the end, have tolerizing therapies to eliminate the, these T cells or modify their functionality. And in order to do that, the structure is that we then take these patient derived TCR sequences and now putting them into DR4 transgenic mice in order to get a fully human uh, mouse. And you may know that it's very difficult to get a citreactive T cell response in a mouse. It's possible, but it demands a lot of immunizations. And we thought that this mouse, which will be human, may help us in the undeveloping tolerizing therapies. So this is ongoing. So then Going back to tolerance, uh, to prevention, which was the basis of this lecture. Um, and this is again, the ladder which I've shown. And then within this consortium, which I began to mention, 
we have had lots of studies on trying to prevent. We have made a small study of making it. We're using the solendronate and seeing whether well, well, that would help to ameliorate pain and progression. In this case, this is a study which was described from Geo Shetty's group and um, uh, Gerald Kranke uh, in ACR actually one and a half years ago. And it shows how they identify individuals at risk at this point of rather large, uh, far advanced in this ladder at the red arrow there. And half of the individuals in this RCT were given abatacept and half were given placebo. And you may have seen that over the first six months, then it were four individuals in the abatacept group I developed RA and 17 in the placebo group. In, when they followed these patients for 18 months, and I think that is not published, but has been shown in a number of lectures, then the patients begin to get arthritis, but never as many as in the, uh, there's still a, a consistent difference between the placebo and abatacep. This is proof of concept that with immunotherapy, you could inhibit the development, but the fact that you don't tolerate means that you have to continue working in order to get this uh, permanent uh, prevention. The other study which I want to mention is from Leiden. They, it was published in Lancet uh, half a year ago, and they took a slightly different definition of individuals at risk for RA. And they gave them cortisone and methotrexate for up to one year. And what was interesting was that the main effect, it was only delay. It was not a prevention, but it was a delay. And those had the highest risk by prediction algorithms. Those were the ones where the difference between different treatment groups and placebo group was the largest. But what I found interesting was that also when they looked at pain, in this case, those who had the highest risk, then pain in this case, uh, it's on the, on the X axis, on the Y axis, I should have put it up. Then pain is reduced a lot in those who had high risk by using this um, immunotherapy showing that again, that is pain appearing before RA is immune mediated and can be affected. So this is my main conclusion slide, I think, one, one of the two, where uh, the point of showing all this and all the mouse studies is that um, we should not have the picture of this linear evolvement of RA from triggering to targeting as we and others have had on a slide for quite some years. We should appreciate that the dynamics, that this process is much more dynamic. So you also have anti-inflammatory, you most probably also have anti-inflammatory processes, both from environmental things, which I mentioned in the beginning, but also from this enormous diversity of the autoantibody response. And then possibly different individuals have different flavors of their autoimmune response, with some being protective, some possibly being contributing to disease. So this means, in a way, that it should also be more feasible to make prevention because you, maybe you just, if you understand this very well, we may just push this system a little bit. And then by those means, accomplish a change of this very dynamic system towards prevention rather than to, uh, towards progression of the disease. So conclusion of this is that um, we think that this proves that autoimmunity indeed has to be investigated on the clonal level. We would never have seen this diversity and these different functionalities had we only worked with CCP rates and with serum antibodies. We really have, when we are looking for humor on new autoimmunity, go to clonality. The immune system is clonal. And then the second is that autoimmunity may be disease inducing and is protective. Then the precautions, of course, that is only one model. We are pre presently working a lot with also other models to see is this consistent over different models. 
And finally, I mean, mice are not humans. So we are, of course, uncertain whether this is at all the same thing in human beings. Not easy to test, but um, just we have to be aware, of course. So my final other slide is to go back to the challenge. If we now know that there are ways of modifying the environment by reducing the disease promoting events, maybe they by smoking, maybe there are other airway exposures, maybe there are periodontitis, other things. We are also approaching a situation where we could make much more trials and in due time clinical practice to indeed prevent the disease with pharmacological trials. And we now setting up in our consortia infrastructures that will enable that on a pan-European level. And there's quite a lot of interest of using different drugs in this pre-RA state. And we often com compare, of course, what happened with hypertension, that, of course, you use antihypertensive before you have your ischemic heart disease. And we are quite convinced that we are going there for RA and other immune-mediated diseases in due time. But then the, the, the challenge is, of course, then how to identify and use these type of things in an at risk population where we are so overwhelmed with taking care of our RA patients, other rheumatological patients, that we, how should we create time for this? And the truth is, of course, that we don't have that time. So we have to do it otherwise. So this is the project that we got some funding from a, another EU grant source for called EIT Health. And then we are developing digital tools for doing that. The idea is that we have made a screening instrument which called rheumatic. With lots of questions which we have developed based on exactly the type of symptomatology that we know is occurring before onset. The pain patterns, the fatigue, the uh, little bit of morning stiffness, and putting that together in a, que in a questionnaire and making an algorithm out of that. That questionnaire, we think, can be particularly used by primary care physicians, but also by patients themselves, and of course, by rheumatologists, if you want to have that as a screening. Those become positive for that. They can then use this multiplex test. And I, in, the, in the next slide, I show the multiplex test that we have used for all these different uh, studies, which I show. This is now a multiplex test for about um, 15 different citronated peptides and the arginine counterparts, and also a number of other autoantigens used in, in rheumatology. And we used that, to, we developed that together with the company Thermo Fisher, uh, but we are losing all the assays. And those who become positive to that, then we could make a prediction of how active, how, how big is the risk. And then we are trying to then equip these individuals at risk with a digital companion with an app. And that app can then be used by the patients or the, the individuals not yet patients in our rheumatology clinic to follow their symptomatology. And we know that when you have emerging more pain and more specific symptoms, you have more risk. And then making a type of risk estimation. This is work ongoing, not yet there. And the idea is, of course, that we could then help also have that also as a tool for evaluate effects on these um, the symptoms if you have clinical trials in this phase of pre-RA. And then hoping that some of them will go towards prevention. But then the other point is that is why I show this picture of the value of very early diagnosis is that if you are in this cohort and you get your very first signs of arthritis, then you could sort of have a signal to your rheumatologist and say, I really had my first sign of arthritis and have an educational element in this tool to say, how should you appreciate the first signs of arthritis? And then you could get your first diagnosis, hopefully, and first therapy within a few weeks rather than in a number of months. So that is the strategy that we have put forward in this um, a project trying to have both prevention and to, to enable both prevention and early therapy with minimal effort from rheumatologists 
with maximum effort from the patients themselves using these type of digital tools. So we think that we, we lots of things that we don't understand of this emergence of disease, but we could do a lot of things for the prevention already now with lifestyles and hopefully more and more with therapies and trying to use this system for the early diagnosis and early therapy. And uh, in a way, I think that RA becoming a disease where we have so much to learn about how an immune response may be triggered. We know in contrast to diabetes, we know quite well how it may be triggered in lungs and joints and, and gums and elsewhere, and how it evolves over time, causes different distinct symptoms, which we could appreciate and use for our for detection and then go further. So I think that we have in RA a very interesting time, not only for the fantastic uh, development of therapies that we have for established disease, but also for actually going to prevention. And we call that, of course, precision prevention in order to be, to be a bit uh, fancy. Uh, so with this, I want to thank my epidemiology friends. Lars Alperson has ta taught me everything about epidemiology. Leonid from Russia is doing the genetics. Vivi, as I mentioned several times, is the, um, the person who is really the, the very knowledgeable in everything concerning immunology and cell immunology, uh, Bruno, and then Anka's group, and then many others. And um, this is the group working in the, um, the prevent study and um, a lot of funding. And with this, I, I stop share and um, saying that um, have to take questions. Um, and a little bit sorry that I cannot see you because um, that uh, I will see some of you in the afternoon and uh, when Ingrid gets her, gives her lane lecture. Thank you very much, Lars, for a really fantastic uh, talk. Um, we have at this point one question uh, submitted to us from uh, Gordon Starkebaum, who is asking, uh, do the pain inducing ACPA cause pain by acting on nerve cells or by becoming immune complexes? Um, we think they act, uh, as far as we know just now, we know that FC receptors are needed. We think that immune complexes are needed in the context of the um, in both the uh, osteoclast and that jo joint environment in and in the dorsal root ganglia. But details of this uh, dorsal root ganglia, that, that is a paper that is submitted by Camilla. So uh, soon coming out, we hope. But anyway, it appears that FC receptors and probably immune complexes are essential, but not any type of immune complex. You have to have anti ACPA. I was also wondering if um, the inhibitory uh, CCPs and the, the monoclonal ACPA uh, that blocked uh, the Kaya model, could the blocking antibodies have simply reacted with collagen and prevented the anti-collagen antibodies from uh, binding and driving inflammation? Yeah, I mean, that was one of the first questions we asked ourselves. And we, of course, checked that very carefully. So there's no interference at all with the collagen antibodies. Okay. Another question I have is, um, uh, would you predict uh, that inhibition of citrullination, for example, with a PAD2 or PAD4 uh, inhibitor, would uh, have a dramatic therapeutic benefit for patients? Yeah, I mean, that, 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 that may very well be so. And in, as indicated from the PAD4 experiments, that may be the case. And we have also, as a matter of fact, it's uh, one of my other colleagues, Ben Serati, who has worked quite a lot with different PAD inhibitors uh, exactly on that. So we have effects of a few different PAD inhibitors on the pain and on the bone loss. Uh, we have not looked at it in the context of this um, uh, inhibitor functionalities, which are more recent. So, and as you may know, there are several companies trying to develop PAD inhibitors, but of course, it's, it's not it's not easy because PAD and citronation has such important functionalities in the nucleus and with histones. So you 
and how to try to have fat inhibitors that do not go into nucleus and affect these fundamental functionalities, but go elsewhere. And I'm not sure, sure that they have succeeded doing that properly. So, so would you also predict that uh, such inhibitors, if, if they are safe enough and can be used, uh, that they would need to be used fairly early on? Uh, will there come a time when, I guess, epitope spreading and other modifications are important enough uh, later in the disease where these inhibitors would no longer work? Yeah, I mean, this is a question that we all have discussed for a long time. Is it so that the adaptive immune system is um, most important in the uh, induction of the disease? And after that, maybe fibroblast, macrophage, um, um, uh, T cell, B cell interactions take over, and that you have uh, epigenetic modifications in the fibroblast. There are many people investigating that, as you may know. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure that these are factors that it becomes more chronic and we should, and that this is one of the reasons why it pays off to treat very early, that it becomes, there is a chronicity generation in these non-immune cells. But genetics uh, uh, tell us that there is an impact of MEC class two alleles also over the longitudinal course of disease. And that, to me, indicates that there is, an, there is a, an effect continuously of MEC class two restricted T cell uh, activation. Okay, thank you. Um, does anybody have more questions at this time? Doesn't look like it, so I, I will reserve uh, my additional questions to uh, when I meet you in, in a one-on-one -on -one setting uh, a little bit later here in the morning. And uh, if there are no other questions, uh, let's uh, thank Lars very much for a wonderful talk and, uh, and, and convene this meeting. And I have to thank you all for listening and 